Imagine a time before encounters, before portals, even before augments, when TFT was simple and the only thing that mattered were your units, your items, and your wits. With the stakes higher than ever and the player base at an all-time high, how did Wright do the impossible and improve on what many consider to be the perfect set? Wright embarked on this journey in typical Wright fashion. Add more stuff. They introduced lucky lanterns, gifts that bestowed items, fonts, spatulas, and other treasures. Adjustments were made to their chosen system to make it a bit harder to find the perfect chosen every single time. But this whole tweak was probably a little incorrect as it gave us one of the wildest metas in all of TFT, the one cost reroll meta. Some would say removing Hunter, Moonlight, and Dusk was a little bit of a risk. Units like Riven, Aphelios, and Ari, even if some people hated them, there were just as many who loved them. Hunter was replaced by Executioner, reminiscent of Set 3's Valkyrie. Dusk and Moonlight became Dragonlord and Fabled. Elderwood was probably the Set 4 trait that had the most changes. Swapping out Ezreal, who I think nobody missed, for Orn, Ash for Zaya, and Hecarim for Rakan, transformed his playstyle and tied it into a much stronger thematic. I'll also give him players something they'll remember for the rest of their TFT careers the infamous Elderwood Nunu comp. To this day, people still talk about Elderwood Nunu, and I think Set 12 gave people a slice of what it's like to experience that insanity. Nunu, it seems, no matter the set, always finds a way to be broken. The ability to splash Keeper meant that you could have even more Elderwood stacks, plus <laughs> Rakan was absolutely busted on release, having no mana lock on his ability, so he could disarm and shield over and over and over again. Orn with his Summoner's Rift Ultimate was a CC juggernaut, but his real value was the introduction to the artifact items, our first ever evergreen feature, well eventually. And if you played back then, you'd remember how broken these items were on release. Eternal Winter, for example, was just insane. And if you had a Frozen Heart as well, the enemy just wouldn't even be able to play the game anymore. And in case you're missing him, in set 4.5, there was even a Blitzcrank hook artifact. Ain't that lovely? Even when you think he's gone, he always finds a way back in. Of course, there was still Vagar to play around, and infinite stacking Vagar comps have always been something people love. And the idea of getting as much AP as humanly possible is a visceral feeling that people need when they play TFT. It's just so much fun to watch that number go up and up. And if you really want to see a number go up and up, you can subscribe to my channel and like the video. If this video gets at least 5 likes, I will continue to make these retroactives. But Elderwood wasn't the only trait that got a whole new playstyle. Divine got Kale, which is probably the best decision Riot made in 4.5, because not only did Divine get a solid ranged carry, which it desperately needed, Kale fit the theme perfectly, and Warwick was a bit strange in that regard. You don't tie Warwick into Divinity, but Kale, you absolutely do. Imagine having a Divine trait without Kale, it's just weird. Kale also brought her set 3 ability, and with the Executioner's trait, her crazy high attack speed and attack based ability, you could play for insane damage or attack speed. And once she hit that divine bonus, she could almost one shot entire boards on her own. She really encapsulated that ascension thematic that Riot wanted Divine to be a lot more than what it could ever dream of. Then there was the whole new origin, Dragon Soul, which brought back some old fan favourites in Aurelian Soul, Braum, and Swain from set 1. And people who played back then will remember Shivana that took over the meta from day 1. Shivana scaled massively with max health, and the Dragon Soul bonus having max health baked into its damage, with the right chosen, the right positioning, you could hit some silly numbers with Shivana and Brawler. But then there was not only Shivana that had a moment, Rand and Aurelian Soul, and Aurelian Soul replaced Ari, who was always problematic. You are able to play a mage Dragon Soul comp that would blow up boards instantly. Though Aurelian Soul was similar to his set 1 form, he had one distinct difference. By double casting, he got an insane damage amp, and you could chuck in almost any frontline, and Aurelian would just kill boards instantly. And then with Brand, there was a crazy reroll mage build that utilized 3 star Annie and Brand CC, where Annie could just solo face tank entire teams with ease. And with Luden still scaling with CC at the time, Brand's damage was absolutely bonkers. Not to mention with the mage spat, you could toss in almost any unit, further instantiating my belief that sets with double cast mechanics are the best and you cannot convince me otherwise. Swain was amazing as well, he received the new Siphonous trait and as you can expect it turned him into a drain tank that could sometimes 1v9 boards while Aurelian Soul or maybe Morgana killed everyone. Siphoner was a cool idea and had some crazy Nasus builds that people just loved to play. 
But if you couldn't three star the doge, you could easily just splash Morgana and Swain later on in the game and get a little bit of healing. There was Olaf as well, who, along with Trendamir, brought in some Slayer splashes. Slayer was a new addition, bringing with it Daria, Samira, Olaf, and Trendamir. Samira is an interesting case in TFT where she had no direct origin. She was not tied to Elderwood, Dragon Soul, or any of the things that existed. She only existed as Sharpshooter or Slayer. But that didn't matter. She was really emblematic of her Summer's Rift version of herself and truly captured that high risk, high reward playstyle. And watching her dash into the enemy team and either kill everyone or die was kind of hilarious. Even if at some point she was disgustingly OP. Fabled was the new Vanguard Mystic. It did take some time to get into the swing, um, but it did bring back set 1 Cho, set 2 Nautilus, and gave us Nico, which if you saw in your lobby, you'd almost always cry because it was just too tanky. But Fable was just kind of a cool 3-piece trait you could splash in with other comms, with it fitting into Mystics, Vanguard, Bruiser. You had many ways to get it in, and for the units to get their insane abilities, Nautilus getting damage reduction on the shield, Nico getting damage amp on a third pop, and Cho'Gath actually getting to knock up the entire entire goddamn board. Some things didn't change that much though, and without Ari, Spirit was relegated to an entirely support trait that either functioned to facilitate Zed, Diana, or Sharpshooters. Either way, it still had its place in the meta, and Zed maintained himself as one of the peak units of set 4 and 4.5, only this time, he was a slayer and not a shaded. But he wasn't the only backline access. One thing that really took the set by storm was Assassin. You could play for Akali, Katarina, or even Diana. And Diana, who was a part of the one cost meta, had an insane run at being one of the best reroll comps of the set. And was probably the only spirit unit that existed as an actual unit and not just as an attack speed buff. And the Assassin was just kinda crazy. And it was probably this time that Riot started to think to themselves, hmm, maybe Assassin isn't so good for the game. Warlord got a fresh kind of paint, Trend and Mir fleshed out the trait, so it wasn't just a reroll comp, and between Jarvan and Azir and Vi, you had options to splash what traits you needed, but the most natural was obviously Keeper. That wasn't to say that Warlord didn't have reroll, I mean again we're talking about a set with a one cost reroll meta, it just wasn't reliant on it. You could still reroll Nidalee Katarina, who were two of the best comps in the set, and do extremely well, but now you had options if you didn't hit your 3 star, you could just get to 9. Duelist got Trend and Mir, but it was Yasuo and Yone that carried that trait, with the Aswo reroll being what you typically play for in every single game, and he was absolutely filthy, especially at the beginning of the set. Cultist lost two units and gained another two. Sivir was featured heavily in some comps, mainly to splash with Pike for Sharpshooter and Slayer for Samira, but if you ever got a chosen Cultist, it was almost always correct to play for Fast 9 and win with Galio. Of course, there's still Fortune, and the introduction of Darius made it infinitely better. Because if you hit a 2 star in stage 3 or 4, you could easily cash out your insane loss streak. And that led some players, myself included, to just play Fortune every single game. Darius meant that with 6 Fortune, you had options to play around and actually win rounds. Whereas with Jinx, it was tough to get to a point of strength without her being a 3 star. With Darius, you could easily snowball a lead from the moment he was 2 star. But the thing is, set 4.5 wasn't about as verticals, a large chunk of the meta was more about how you could build your trait whips. A bit of bruiser here, some elderwood there, sprinkling a maid, whatever your chosen happened to be. And that's not to say verticals are weak, it's just the fact that set 4 managed to strike a slim balance at the latter half of the set, where you could play a 3 piece, 6 piece or a 9 piece and succeed. You could play reroll, you could play fast 8, you could play fast 9 or whatever you wanted and win if you were good enough. For instance, 4 Adept, 4 Divine was a staple and was almost always there in the meta Unlightened, you could play as a 2 piece, a 4 piece, or a 6 piece in the right circumstances, especially in the early point of the set when Viewer was also part of the 1 cost reroll meta. And there was one big change that they did have was Dazzler was removed, so Morgana got the Siphoner treatment. Your talent didn't really need to build healing items anymore, he could just get Siphoner and kill everyone and sustain. Keeper was really one of the traits that came into its own, with having so many different ways to play, from 6 Keeper, Executioner, to 4 Keeper, 4 Sharpshooters, each one capping around different legendaries, especially as a mirror or strong forecast, but the shielding itself was incredibly frustrating to play against. Then there was this filthy Tristana reroll build that Aegon managed to put in the consciousness of every player in TFT, a horrible moment in set 4, when everyone was rolling to 0 at 3-2 to try and hit, and that's what I mean. 4.5 
lives, early balancing was rough. But I don't think that should distract from how good the set actually was. I mean, yes, the nerves to their level 8 chosen odds and the fact that lucky dice existed meant that getting to 8 and praging wasn't the optimal strategy, as you'd take too much damage in stage 3 as everyone had a 3 star 1 cost. It took a little bit of time to get it right, but that's okay. It was awesome to see what it was like to play the game when pretty much the only thing were 1 cost reroll. I think in my opinion that 4.5 is the only time in TFT history where the 0.5 set worked for me and felt better than its normal set. Yes, I know that that might be a controversial opinion and most people and Riot themselves say that 0.5s typically improved on the set, but I disagree. Most 0.5s were boring, uninspired and frankly mediocre at best because they removed core elements of what made the original set so fun. As Leduc put it, every time the Riot introduces a patch, it's like your toys get slowly taken away because in the ongoing pursuit of balance, we always lose the element of fun. But set 4.5 was so much more than any of them, so much more than set 4 ever was. It was thematically beautiful, conceptually sound, and had trait webs that fit together perfectly. It was a moment where, at least in the latter half, all play styles were viable and strong, but also when flexibility was the optimal strategy, where you didn't go into a game unlocking your comp at 2-1, well, again, not in the one goes reroll meta, but rather you waited to see what you got later on. You could play around almost any tier of unit, it was a beautiful moment. And the point 0.5 set is a concept that's pretty flawed, but it was definitely a necessary evil for Riot to keep making TFT at the time that they did. And looking back, there were probably more misses than hit, but 4.5 was not one of them. It really elevated what set 4 could be and made it into a set, at least for me, I will cherish for as long as I keep making those videos. It was this set and set 2 that inspired me to make them, because looking back at where we've been to dip our toes into what we loved all those years ago is a beautiful thing that I want to share with other people that feel the same. I hope that set 4 gets its revival. It deserves it. I love set 2 the most for what it represented to me, and while set 6 might have been the set that changed TFT forever, set 4.5 is Riot's magnum opus, and showed their potential for what they can do when they get it right, and when they get it right, it's always a banger.